So okay. Sebastian, you're, you're yeah, there, do you want to go ahead and share? Yes, thank you. So I, I can share. Yeah. Let me let me try to share. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, we, we got can, it. Can you see my slides? Yes, it's good. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, uh, introduce our next speaker. Sebastian Franco will be telling us about uh, 2D supersymmetric gauge theories, D brains, and duality. So take it away, Sebastian. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, you know, as usual, I, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for putting together this nice event uh, that brings us uh, together. Hopefully, you know, next year we'll be even more together than that right now. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about my work. Um, and today I will, I will discuss what I have been doing for the past uh, several years and touch on work in progress. And it goes under the general theme of uh, theories in low dimension, two dimension with a low amount of supersymmetry, uh, the realization in string theory, how we understand this uh, general and beautiful phenomenon, phenomenon of duality. Uh, this has been done uh, in collaboration with several uh, collaborators, including some like Rak Seong, that I think is in the audience today. So, again, the, because of time, you know, this will be uh, kind of brief, but feel free to ask any questions that uh, you want. You know, uh, quantum field theory underlines of uh, our understanding of, of several areas of physics nowadays, from particle physics to condensed matter physics. We do very precise calcula calculations that are much by nature uh, on a daily basis. But uh, having said that, I, I think it's fair to say that our understanding of quantum field theory at the fundamental level is uh, undergoing a lot of exciting developments you know, from integrability, bootstrap, uh, understanding of dualities, uh, thinking about theories uh, without Lagrangians, thinking beyond what we uh, originally studied. Uh, it's, it, it's, this is evolving on a daily basis. And realizing quantum field theories in string theory or M theory, these more fundamental theories, uh, is often a powerful uh, approach uh, for uncovering new phenomena or uh, for providing an alternative perspective on things that we already know, right? Often this new perspective is quite geometric. Um, it gives us another angle for understanding things or also, you know, new ideas of how to generalize things that we know. Uh, the prototypical example that, you know, many of some of my colleagues in the audience have, have worked on uh, goes under the way, way the name of brain tilings. Uh, so, you know, it, the infinite family of four dimensional n equals to one super conformal field theories on these three brains, probing some geometries which are called Tori Calabria of three folds, are described by brain tilings. I will show you a picture of what that is. Uh, why this is interesting, it's interesting for many reasons, but we live in four dimensions. Uh, you know, n equals to one supersymmetry is the minimal amount of supersymmetry close to having not zero supersymmetry like we observed. Uh, N equals to one supersymmetry is interesting for a uh, you know, uh, phenomenological perspective. It's, it's one traditional uh, avenue for physics beyond the standard model. And the typical scenario for physics beyond the standard model. And superconformal field theories are theories that also are connected to the ADSFT correspondence or gauge gravity duality. So it turns out that if we think about this kind of configuration, you know, we have these three brains, these extended objects of string theory, which have a three plus one dimensional word volume, three space and one time dimension, very much like the world we live in. Uh, and we put them probing, we say we probe uh, Calabria of three folds and singularity. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is just a cartoon of the configuration. There are 10 dimensions of string theory I cannot represent on my, on my screen today. Uh, you know, this geometry does something interesting to the brains in such a way that a non-trivial gauge theory arises on the different brains. Mm -hmm. And we are interested in 
understanding how this geometry determines the gauge theory and how the gauge theory here determines or it's related to the geometry. And it turns out there are some nice objects which are called brain tilings. Uh, this is a representation of them, uh, which are bipartite graphs on a two dimensional torus. So this is a unit cell of the two dimensional torus. So this side should be identified with this one and this one with this one. Uh, we can also call them, you know, the, the, the study of these things, we can call it dimer models. Uh, that these kind of objects are some interesting bridge between the geometric and the quantum field theory world. There are an interesting bridge between the two because I'm not going to tell you how, but the quantum field theory is, you know, it's very easy to, to read it from this graph. We can, we can find the gauge uh, symmetries, the matter content of the particles and the interactions between them by you know faces, edges, and nodes. And it's very easy also to read the geometry out of it. Mm -hmm. But this thing is more than that. It's not just a gadget. If it was a gadget, it would be a very useful gadget and it would be interesting on its own right. It's actually a physical configuration of brains, which is related by T duality to the brains at this singularity. Mm -hmm. So this graph that I'm representing here is uh, a cartoon or a simplified depiction of a brain configuration in which this graph is representing a brain wrapped over some surface. And the surfaces on the screen that are bounded by this graph uh, are represented some DeFi brains. DeFi brains are again some other extended object which has a five plus one dimensional word volume since they are finite in some two internal dimensions, these objects lead to a four dimensional quantum field theory like we are interested in. So, so far, so good. And, you know, this is a, an old story, but brain tilings have significantly simplified the connection between quantum field theory and geometry. Some problems that were doable, but kind of uh, involved before now are, are really straightforward. And they have found multiple applications going from ADS-CFT correspondence to stream phenomenology. You know, we might want to have details of what this local geometry looks like if we want to realize some kind of quantum field theory here. And also like things like cluster algebras uh, and things like that. And so that was a very successful story for four dimensional theories. So, very good. So today, what I want to do is to continue, continue this story and think about quantum field theories in two dimensions. And this will be related to Calabria of four folds, as we will see. Uh, this kind of studies, one, one might ask why, one is inter, why someone is interested in, in theories in two dimensions. These theories are interesting uh, for a variety of reasons. They're interesting. For example, in our ongoing program of understanding quantum field theory in general. So people are investigating quantum field theories in different dimensions, the connections between them, uh, the relations between them, what is possible in quantum field theory. You know, these theories are also realized in let's say defects or, or flux tubes in supersymmetric quantum field theories and so on. So these are, these are theories which are, are indeed relevant. And uh, investigating quantum field theories with supersymmetry in two dimensions is uh, a timely problem uh, because there has been significant progress uh, in recent years uh, on the quantum field theory side. You know, we, we have connected these theories to higher theories in higher dimensions. We, we have understood the renormalization group flow much better new exact results, new dualities that I will discuss. So it would be interesting to see what string theory has to say about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to have this kind of picture now, you know, very similar to the one before, but I changed some of the numbers here. So instead of these three brains, I have D1 brains. So these are objects in string theory which have two dimensional word volumes. Um, uh, Probing the Calabria of fourfold, which is four complex dimensions. And I want to understand this dictionary once again. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's fair to say that the engineering of this theory is using these kind of configurations. By the way, there are other methods for engineering these theories, but this approach uh, was uh, relatively underdeveloped. Uh, you know, there were some basic words from the 90s about all defaults and the corresponding play configurations. Uh, so this was the state of the art. Mm -hmm. There are some configurations which are called brain boxes, but as I, these, are, these configurations don't do all the things that the ones that I will discuss today do. In particular, they don't connect to geometry uh, so clearly. And what we're going to do is we are going to, let's say, build a new program which uh, repeats, hopefully, the successes of the brain tilings for Calabria O3 force. Mm -hmm. uh, we will see that it's not a straightforward generalization, it's an interesting generalization of diver models of brain tilings. Um, this is something that I won't discuss today, but once you achieve that, you can go beyond Calabria four folds, you can go to higher dimensional Calabria M folds uh, and map geometry to quantum field theory or quivers more generally uh, and understand some dualities that appear there. Mm, and you can also develop a unified framework describing the resulting theories and their dualities in different dimensions. Uh, these are all parts of my work. Uh, you know, I'm happy to discuss that, or you, know, you can look at uh, some of our papers, uh, and it's a very beautiful story that I, I won't be able to cover today. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about two-dimensional 0,2 theories. First, 0,2 here means the amount of supersymmetry. You know, in two dimensions, this is one space, one time dimensions, you have left mover and right movers. Uh, this means that the left movers don't see any supersymmetry, the right movers see some supersymmetry. Uh, so let me go over the basics of these theories. These theories can be written using uh, what's called 0, 0,2 superspace in two dimensions. And they have a number of superfields. You know, these are the things that replace the ordinary fields that we are used to in the supersymmetric theory. They are useful building blocks. You know, instead of uh, trying to write the theory by brute force, you know, we can use the, these building blocks plus some prescriptions and build theories which are supersymmetric. So the basic building blocks are vector multiplets or vector superfields that correspond to the gauge interactions. Uh, the gauge, uh, no, the, the on shell degrees of freedom of these uh, vector multiplets are some uh, left-handed uh, gauge you know. the chiral fields that have scalar and right-handed fermion, and there will be another type of matter field, which is called the Fermi, which has uh, a left-handed fermion in there. So if you see things that are left-handed don't have super partners, they don't have this typical uh, feature of supersymmetric theories in which uh, particles of different spin comes together, but that's fine because there's a zero on the left-handed uh, the amount of supersymmetry, but the right-handed fields come with super partners. Uh, zero comma two theories have a symmetry under the exchange of Fermi's with the their conjugates, uh, and that will be relevant for our theories. Uh, the theories that arise in in our constructions are of a very special type. Uh, they're not general gauge theories, they're what's called quiver gauge theories. And quiver gauge theories are theories that can be, uh, you know, have gauge symmetries, which will be represented by nodes in a graph. And they have uh, matter fields, in this case, what chiral and Fermi, which are transforming in bifundamental representations of them. That's why they can be represented by lines or arrows connecting a pair of nodes. So this is, a, I will represent chiral fields by arrows between two nodes. This means that the chiral field is transforming in the fundamental representation of the node at the tape and the fundamental representation of the node at the head. It's an adjoint if it starts and finishes on the same node. And 
similar representation for Fermi's that which I will represent with red lines. You see that I don't add any orientation to the Fermi. That's because of this symmetry. Mm. You know, the, whether the, 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 the Fermi goes from node one to two, node two or node two to node one, uh, it's irrelevant. So quivers will look like this. You know, this is a quiver for one of the geometries I will consider. They have four UN groups, a lot of matter. You know, these are two chirals going from four to one, two chirals going from one to two, Fermi's connecting some of them, and so on. There are some nice features here. For example, if you count the number of chirals terminating on a node minus the number of Fermi's, you will see that there are always two. So here they have four chirals and two Fermi's. Here you have six chirals and node one and four Fermi's. That has to do with some consistent condition of the quantum field theory, which is called anomaly cancellation. Uh, the theories have, uh, are not just described by, by the quivers. Uh, they also have uh, some functions that encode the interactions of the theories, uh, which are two for each Fermi, there are two functions which I would call E and J, which are holomorphic functions of the chiral fields. Mm. Uh, zero comma two theories are interesting uh, in the sense that they still have a holomorphy. And they enter as follows in the definition of your theories. The J terms are coupled to the Fermi's by terms like this. And the E terms appear as some deformation of the chirality condition of the Fermi's. So if you think about the quantum numbers of the J function, they have to be a conjugate of, of the quantum numbers of the Fermi's in order to make a gauge invariant here, and symmetry invariant, uh, while the E terms have the same quantum numbers of, of the corresponding Fermi. The, the, the obey consistency condition of your theory, which is some kind of orthogonality condition between the E's and J's, sometimes we call this the trace condition. And from these two functions, uh, we can construct many, you know, the actual Lagrangian in components of, of the gauge theory. Uh, for those of you who are more familiar with four dimensional N equals to one supersymmetry, uh, these two functions are very similar to having two sets of F terms, uh, which are only associated to the Fermi's. So in particular, uh, you know, they will give rise to couplings between two fermions and scalars, very similar to Yukawa couplings and generalizations in the same way that F terms gives rise to them. And they will also produce some contributions to the scalar potential very much like having two sets of F terms. Uh, and finally, as I said, in these sets of quivers, uh, anomaly, anomaly cancellation uh, states that the number of chirals minus the number of Fermi's at each, each node has to be equal to two times the rank of the node. Uh, very good. So, uh, any questions so far? cannot see the chat, but you know, just uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask me if, if you want. So I'm not going to, I said that I'm interested in this uh, Calabria of four folds probe by D-brains. I'm not going to uh, consider generic Calabria of four folds. I will consider some special types of them. These are not compact, but uh, they will be toric. And toric is very interesting because first of all, it's, it's a general, rather general infinite family of these geometries, but uh, more importantly, because it will lead to some constraint on the structure of the theories that will allow for um, the combinatorial analysis of them. In, at the end of the day, it is this toric, uh, the fact that these geometries are toric that will underline the description by these uh, beautiful generalizations of line models. And in particular, where the historic condition shows up is in the structure of the J and E terms, these two functions that I told you behave as F terms. And what we will see is that each Fermi participates exactly 
in two J terms and two E terms, which come with opposite signs. So this is a general example. This is a toric Calawi of threefold, which is so called cone over Q111. This is the toric diagram. It's a three dimensional uh, you know, polytope uh, with integer points, uh, points on an integer lattice that for us describes the geometry. The corresponding quiver diagram is the one that I showed before. It has six Fermis, which are listed here. And uh, for each of them, we have two J terms. You see there's an holomorphic function of the fields. There's no conjugates here for the chiral fields, which couple to the Fermi. And there are two terms that couple to the conjugate Fermi for each of them. Okay, so this structure, you know, I, I have, I'm not explaining to you how this is derived, but this structure is specific, uh, particular of uh, Tori Kalayov four force. And it will be very useful. Mm -hmm. So let's try to put this information uh, in some geometric object. Uh, you know, you can tell me the geometry and if I have to specify you, for you what the, the gauge theory is, uh, it's not sufficient to give you the quiver diagram, this oriented graph, but I also need to uh, give you this uh, uh, J and E terms. For, for the mathematicians in the audience, you know, I had to give you an oriented graph and I had to give you these functions which uh, give rise to relations in the quiver. Uh, very good. So let's try to put the, can I show these two things in a single object? At this point, it will be just a bookkeeping device that has this information. And as I said, imagine that for each of these oriented loops in the graph, which are closed path, these, these terms in a J are written, I draw a closed loop in my quiver. So I have a Fermi going from I to J, then I have some holomorphic function that goes from J to I, this, this would be a J term. Similarly, I have another one, I said I only have two of them. And at the same time, I have some other one, other ones, two of them that couple to lambda ij bar, which means that they are in the go through the firm in the opposite orientation. So the pink ones go through the Fermi from i to j, the blue ones go through the Fermi from j to i. So this is what I can read from all this list of terms. Imagine I want to graphically represent them and put them together as going through the same object. Again, it's a cool bookkeeping device that allows me to show you how uh, good I am animating my, my slides. But let's uh, build an object that comes out of that, okay? So that's what it's going to be a periodic quiver. And you can see where I'm going. You know, I have a Tori Calabria fourfold, which has a U1 to the fourth symmetry and uh, underlying it. Probably I will emphasize a U1 cube. There's a three torus that will arise there similar to, to the two torus that arise in the dimer models for Calabria, Tori Calabria three. So that's where I'm going. So let's put this together and we will have things that look like that. This, this is a, a very crazy example with eight nodes in the quiver. You see that the corners, which I label eight, are identified. So you know, if this is really living on a three-dimensional torus. And what I say is that the minimal plaquettes, where you know, what I mean by minimal plaquettes, it's some minimal loop here where minimal is kind of uh, ill-defined, represent the J and E terms. So how I glue the quiver depends on these J and E terms. The minimal plaquettes are better defined by the dual object, which I will represent in the next slide. But this is the, the main story. So you know, if I look at some minimal plaquettes here, that's a term in the, in the, that's a J or E term, some term in what I would call the superpotential. I can think about other loops, I don't know, like uh, you know, some, I don't see my, some big loop that goes through the Fermi, goes up, goes around, comes back. That term is not, even though it is possible from the point of view of gauge symmetry and so on, it's not there uh, in the superpotential. For the people that are physicists, 
you know, from an effective field theory point of view, this would break uh, some of the global symmetries of the theory. This construction makes some of the global symmetries of my theory, which correspond to the isometries of the Calabi-Yau fourfold, explicit. In particular, there's a U1 cube symmetry, which corresponds to rotations in these three dimensions, three dimensions of the torus, which are explicit here. Hmm? So that's why I say the periodic quivers of a three-dimensional torus and global symmetry emphasize the global symmetry of the HD. At this point, this is just a bookkeeping device. I can give you an ordinary quiver plus all these functions on, I can give you this periodic quiver. Uh, but now let's think about the dual object. Mm -hmm. And again, here I'm being uh, brief, but the dual object is going to be actually a brain configuration. And uh, we will see, it will correspond to doing the following thing. So I'm interested in this kind of setup, Calabia fourfold toric probe by D1 brains. Once again, T duality along some of the directions of that Calabia fourfold will give rise to something that is still having NS5 brains and an NS5 brain, sorry, D5 brains and NS5 brains like the brain the dimer, the entailing. A Daimler model will have D4 brains, which extend in some of the directions. These are the 10 dimensions of string theory. Uh, and there will be something on it. So also an NS5 brain, which shares zero one. Zero one is time and one space dimensions. These are the dimensions in which my quantum field theory lives. And it wraps something on these six dimensions. That something is uh, four real dimensional. Uh, and furthermore, I will do the following. So these two dimensions is where my quantum field theory lives. Two, four, and six will be compactified on a torus. They are related to the torus that I was just talking about. Uh, I mix two, three, I combine two, three, four, five, and six, seven into complex dimensions I will call X, Y, and C. And how this sigma comes from my toric diagram, after all, you know, this has to come from my geometry in some way. Well, you know, uh, sigma is defined by uh, the vanishing of uh, the Newton polynomial. You know, I will have one term in my polynomial for every point in the toric data. So this is one monomial here where the exponents are the coordinates of these points. They will come with some complex coefficients and this will define sigma. Uh, there are four, you know, there's freedom, there's very interesting freedom in these complex coefficients. I can scale three of them away by rescaling X, Y, and C. I can take away one more. So it's like the number of points minus four uh, complex coefficients, but there's still freedom that will play a role later. And this talks about how much supersymmetry is broken here. Of course, this looks much more complicated than, than, than what I want to discuss. But many of the, and first of all, you know, this is an object that lives mainly in three complex dimensions. It's very complicated to visualize. Uh, of course, we have to come up with some useful projection. There are two natural projections. One is the so-called amoeba. That one is the so-called co-amoeba projection. The co-amoeba projection is a projection on the arguments of X, Y, and C, which is a projection of three-dimensional torus. So if you take sigma, you take the Quamiba projection and you take what we can call the tropical limit of that, the skeleton of what you obtain, you will obtain an object which is dual to the periodic quiver that I talked about before. So, you know, this is a crazy periodic quiver. It's, it's actually the periodic quiver for flat C4, that's just four, four complex dimensional flat space. Um, the dual object is something like this. Mm -hmm. For each node, I put some brick. Uh, for every chiral field, I put a dual gray face here. And for each uh, Fermi, I put a red face to make it different, uh, to make, make it emphasize it. Uh, this is made out of truncated octahedra. Uh, you might recognize the truncated octahedra as the corresponding permutohedron. That's a similar story happens in, in dimer models where the basic dimer model is the hexagon. 
So this is what you obtain here. Uh, and the Fermi's are square. Well, let me see. Uh, again, this is a brain configuration in which I should think about some different brains populating this the inside of these bricks. And this three-dimensional structure or, or lattice representing a complicated NS5 brain, the skeleton of an S5 brain. From the point of view of the periodic quiver, the inside of each of these bricks corresponds to a node in the quiver, a gauge symmetry. Uh, the gray faces correspond to chiral fields. The red squares correspond to Fermi's. Uh, the Fermi's are squares because the edges correspond to the J and Etans, the minimal plaquettes. And I told you that each Fermi participates in two J terms and two uh, E terms. This is where toric comes about. This object wouldn't be possible if you we were not talking about torical area uh, four folds. Uh, and please take my word that this significantly simplifies the, the, the gauge theory, gauge theory geometry connection. There's, an, there's, there's a generalization. It's a non-trivial generalization and many consistency conditions that go into this object, but it's similar enough that the analogs of perfect matchings, analogs of uh, zigzag paths uh, for Daimler models and so on. So this is the dictionary once again. We have uh, bricks that correspond to gauge groups or nodes in the quiver. The gray faces correspond to chiral fields. And the red faces uh, correspond to, to Fermi's and so on. So we use this uh, technology to investigate uh, many geometries that go uh, all the way from orbifolds of C4. So here you have uh, one example. Uh, an orbifold of C4 is, you know, C4 is, has a toric diagram, which is a tetrahedron. An orbifold of it is uh, represented by a refinement of that, a refinement of, of, of the tetrahedron. We have things that look like a two-dimensional toric diagram plus a point. This is a calabial threefold uh, times C. These are theories which are easy to obtain because they correspond to uh, dimensional reductions in gauge theory. So orbifolds and dimensional reductions are, are things that are very easy to obtain. And finally, we have things uh, which are inherently four-dimensional uh, and we can also deal with them. Mm -hmm. So for those of you uh, that know, uh, you know, this theory is a square times one point. This is what corresponds to the conifold times C. This cannot be obtained from the well-known theory for the conifold by dimensional reduction. Uh, the orbifolds are also easy to obtain, but we have obtained theories which are not uh, of dimensional reduction uh, type at all. Very good. So, Again, so this, you know, I'm just going over, over the, the main topics. So in recent years, very interestingly, uh, Gale, Gukov, and Putrov identified a new uh, low energy equivalence between two dimensional 0, 0,2 quantum field theories. Mm -hmm. Unrelated to this dimer story or the realization in string theory, and uh, the basic building block uh, looks as follows. So imagine you have a node, this, you know, you can think about global symmetry. So if you are a mathematician, you can think about them as frozen nodes. And you see that you have some number of incoming chirals, some going on, number of outgoing chirals, some Fermi's. In the case of this quiver, the transformation will be very similar. And what they realize is that there are three theories which are equivalent to each other. They propose this based on some physical arguments, you know, goes under the name elliptic genus and uh, matching of anomalies. Uh, so you see that the transformation now it's of order three, it relates to three different theories. Of course, if you have several nodes, it will be much more complicated. Uh, 
it's very similar to the usual cyber duality for the physicists or quiver mutation of ordinary quivers for the mathematicians. You have, you know, in the ordinary quivers, you have incoming and outgoing arrows. Here you have three types of them, incoming, outgoing, and fermis, and they seem to rotate into each other. This is what we call, we will call a dual flavor. And you also have the generation of mesons or composite arrows in this language, you have composition of chiral and Fermi, which gives you Fermi here. You have composition of chirals that would uh, appear here in the same edge of this, this Fermi, but uh, there's a superpotential term that allows you to uh, eliminate them. So this is the analog of a two cycle here. So this is a beautiful new story and we wanted to, to see if we can understand this uh, from the point of view of these new constructions, these diamond model-like constructions. Um, the answer is yes, it corresponds to a simple transformation of uh, the, the, the brain brick model, the, this, this, this three-dimensional kind of diamond model. Uh, in particular, if you have a local configuration that looks like this, like a cube with two Fermi faces, uh, and you replace it in this way, so you don't care about what the rest of the graph is, you just do this operation locally. It turns out that this preserves the toric diagram. Uh, it's an invariance of your, of your theory that it literally corresponds to that reality that I mentioned about, that I just mentioned before. So this is the analog of the square move of the urban renewal transformation in Daimler models. Very well. And you know there are a few more transformations uh, which generalize the cube model, cube move, but uh, that uh, yeah, that this is the basic one. Uh, okay, I have a few more minutes, so let me say a few more words. Uh, we have understood these brain brick models using mirror symmetry. Actually, you can take the uh, I'm, I'm I'm specializing the discussion for Calabria fourfold, but you know. It, discussion I'm going to talk about applies to three folds, five folds, and so on. So for Calabria for n fold, you a toric Calabria for n fold is described by convex polytop in Cn minus one. So you you saw these uh, three-dimensional toric diagrams corresponding to uh, my Calabria of four folds. So this is Calabria of three fold, C3 mod C3 as a two-dimensional toric diagram. This is also called uh, local P2, uh, local P3, C4 mod C4, Scalabia fourfold. Uh, as I said, for all of them, you can write this Newton polynomial in which you have a coefficient, complex coefficient times you know, monomials in the complex variables. For this one, after rescaling, you can write it as X, Y, this is X. For some reason, I call this Y and X, but it's the same, X, Y, y over x, y, and there's a leftover complex coefficient. Uh, this is very similar. You have four points that can be, for whose coefficients can be rescaled away, but you have one additional coefficient. And mirror symmetry maps uh, the original brains, which in our case were uh, D1 brains for the case of n equals to four nine minus two n to a collections of d nine minus n brains. So there will be now d5 brains wrapping n dimensional spheres. So what, what's happening here, every time you increase the dimension of the Calabria manifold by one, you decrease the dimension of your brains in the mirror by one, and you increase the dimension of the spheres by one. So the, dim the dimensionality of your gauge theory reduces by two. So you go from four dimensions to two dimensions to zero dimensions and so on. Uh, you can think about how to uh, represent this mirror symmetry. Um, you use the usual techniques of mirror symmetry. Of course, now everything is higher dimensional, so it's very difficult to, to visualize, but you can do some slices on each of these complex planes. This is an example of uh, a geometry which has some volume in terms of tetrahedra, which is eight. You can see that I can divide this, slice this into eight tetrahedra. That's why this polynomial has eight critical points on the W plane. 
And on each of these uh, X place, you have each of these lines represent uh, an N sphere, a four sphere now. And this gives you the entire geometry. Mm -hmm. So they will intersect in, se in several ways, uh, depending on the intersection is whether you're going to get a chiral or a Fermi in your brain brick model, actually by taking the projection onto the argument of these things, you can actually even build the brain brick model itself. So here, for example, I represent this geometry or the Newton polynomial for this geometry for a very specific choice of coefficients. You can ask what happens when you start playing with those coefficients. And what's going to happen is that uh, these critical points are going to move on the plane and at some point, uh, these uh, paths are going to switch order uh, or you know the types of intersections are going to really change here. And that will uh, actually, if you check what it is, it's actually one of the mutations for triality that I was talking about. Uh, so do I have like four minutes or so? Uh we're getting a little tight. Um, the next talk's supposed to start in four minutes, but I think you know, a, a few Three minutes. minutes. Yes. So Actually, I, just, boss. I should, I'm just running the session. Yang, Yang is the, the, the grand poobah. <laughs> right. right, so let me just say one more thing. Uh, from the point of view of physics, it's interesting to reduce the amount of supersymmetry. Uh, we use supersymmetry you know, because it leads to some nice mathematical structures, for example, but also as a way to have control on the quantum field fields. It's like some additional symmetry, like having a spherical cow, for example. So it's typical to ask what happens if we have uh, less supersymmetry. So can we have, in, in two dimensions, I, I consider 0, 0,2 supersymmetry, that's very little left if you want to reduce the amount of supersymmetry, which is 0, 0,1 supersymmetry, one supercharge. And that corresponds to these seven brains over spin seven manifolds. Um, now we're constructing something that we call spin seven oriented folds. Uh, I, I won't say much about that because we have very little time, but the interesting thing is that this is an oriented fold that is constructed by using Joyce's construction of spin seven manifolds from Calabria four folds. You take the Calabria four fold and you use, you divide, you quotient by an anti-holomorphic involution that preserves what's called the Cayley uh, four form and you obtain a spin seven. So this is a question that you can do at the level of the gauge theory or the brain brick model. Um, because of something that we are interested in, we are interested in something like taking a real slice of the gauge theory. Uh, you can also impose this with an unidentified projection. Uh, very well. Why was we were interested in this is because uh, very recently people proposed a 0 0,1 version of triality. Uh, there was no additional support for that. It turns out that it comes out of the non-uniqueness of the quivers that you can construct for a spin seven manifold. Uh, these were two theories that are related by triality on this node. I'm not writing for you the superpotential, but geometrically they correspond to two theories that you build out of the same Calabria fourfold. The map is not one-to-one, -one, but to one-to-many. Uh, these two theories can be divided by one of these uh, spin seven oriented folds and you obtain these two theories, which furthermore are related, not surprisingly by the 0, 0,1 triality. So it's a beautiful geometric realization of that quotient. People were asking why the theories that participate in this look like a real slice, uh, how to formalize the real slice, uh, why there are orthogonal groups which are, are necessary, where well, the story is very simple in this context. You just have the geometric construction of spin seven manifolds by Joyce. So just to conclude, I told you about brain brick models, which is a new class of brain configurations that uh, are connected by T duality to D1 brains on Calabria fourfolds. The fully encode general class of two dimensional 0, 0,2 quiver gauge theories. So uh, and they simplify the gauge theory geometry connection in both directions. I didn't tell you how, but uh, they do. Uh, triality becomes a simple transformation there. So that's another cute uh, part of the story. And we extended that beyond Calabria four folds to this uh, spin seven oriented folds, which 
the, you know, these constructions provide a very elegant explanation of many of the things that were observed uh, for 0, 0,1 theories, at least in this class of theories. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for your patience. So let's thank the speaker and maybe uh, uh, one or two quick questions for Sebastian, uh, and then we'll move on to the next talk. So questions? I have a, a naive question. Hi, Sebastian, this is George. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have a, a na nice talk. Uh, there are naive questions about, can you combine mirror symmetry and triality in some way so that at least in some limit, I don't know, some inferred limit, you, 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 you relate three calabials or three spin sevens, is, is this possible? Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, I have an additional slide, which I do have, but you know, I don't know how to switch to that. You know, that that's what we studied with, with BAFA. You know, that, that was really our, our goal. Uh, what, uh, let me show you this picture. Uh, you know, these critical points are not, they have a very beautiful ordering on the complex plane. Uh, each of these, of, of, of these uh, vanishing paths are, are related to one of the nodes in your quiver. And they are sorted or are organized on the complex plane such that, you know, the first ones to come uh, correspond to incoming chirals for a given node. Then they're Fermis and then they're going chirals. So uh, having them in the wrong order would be like having uh, your know, brains in Harani with and set up in the wrong order and breaking supersymmetry. What happens when you start playing with the coefficients of these things is that you can shrink one of these uh, paths and maybe it, make it grow path, let's say all the incoming chirals <coughs> in a new slice of this pizza, if you want. And you can see that the types of slices of the pizza are really correlated with the dimension of the Calabria manifold. So uh, for Calabria of three folds, you only have two types of uh, slices, you know, the ones that are defined by incoming chirals or going chirals, that you want, that's why you have cyber duality. In this case, you have three regions now. You know, that's why you have triality. Uh, of course, once we saw that, we propose you know, like a or duality of order four for matrix models. And actually you can say the same thing for uh, Calabria m uh, Of course, there, uh, what you are talking about is more complicated. What you are talking about is the quivers that arise on the B model on this Calabria m uh, But yes, yes. So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful question and you know, we, we studied it. We, we started. Thank you. Thank you.